Good morning. For anyone that I haven't met yet, I am Pastor Nick Berlanga. I am the United Methodist Pastor for the Goodrich United Methodist Church and the Goodrich Community. Welcome to the first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of Hope. I have to tell you, I love this season. Well, I love most of this season. Not real big on the stress around shopping, and don't ask me about gift wrapping. That's not my forte at all. But I will admit that nothing compares to the giddiness that I feel this time of year. It was so exciting last week when we put up the, the greens, and it just felt like something special is, is coming. And I love the things like the glove drive that we're holding, or when you hear the bells for the ringers with the red kettles, things like caroling for shut-ins, and the list goes on and on, all the different ways that this time of year is special. And one of the ways that this time of year is special is the fact that for a lot of us, it gives, up, gives us an opportunity to see family, both related family or chosen family, and that's another reason I love this season. Well, since I mentioned Advent, I think I should start this morning by explaining just what Advent is. Now, the word Advent means the arrival or the beginning of something. So, this, this period of time, is the start of the Christmas season. Advent, for the church, signifies the four weeks before Christmas. And for these four weeks, we prepare ourselves for the celebration of the birth of Jesus, for the coming of the Messiah. And we light the four candles of the Advent wreath. They represent love, hope, peace, joy. We'll spend time reflecting on Jesus' birth story. And this year, we're going to spend time reflecting on Jesus' family. We're going to talk about some of the members of his related family, some of his chosen family. So that's our series heading into Christmas, Jesus' family. And we're going to kick off the series by talking about one of the most important people in the Christmas story, Mary, Jesus' mom. Because without her answering God's call, Christmas story pretty much grinds to a halt. You know, there isn't, isn't much there. So we're going to begin at the beginning, at least in Luke's version of the gospel. Luke kicks us off with God's call to Mary and Mary's initial response. So what do we know about Mary? Hmm. Well, when we read the Christmas narratives, we learn right off the bat that she's a virgin. We learn that she's young, probably about 14, from the lower class of society. We have to remember she's living in a male-dominant world. In fact, we know that she's pledged in marriage to Joseph. And given her status, she was probably pledged when she was still quite young. So she would have known her entire life what her lot was going to be, to be Joseph's wife. She has a pretty lowly status. Even her name, Mary, is common. There's six Marys in the New Testament alone. It's just a common name. Our particular Mary is a person who doesn't seem to have anything special going for them. Even where she's from is humble. Galilee is a backwater place. Now, Jerusalem is the cool city. That's where everybody wants to be. But to get to the region of Galilee in the north, one had to cross that hated area of Samaria. So Galilee was kind of exiled. 
And even in the region of Galilee, the city of Nazareth, where our, city, where our story takes place, was looked down upon. Later, when Jesus gathers up his disciples, Nathaniel, who's invited to join the group, says, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Mary is from the wrong side of the tracks. She's a powerless young female, common in name and birthplace, unmarried and poor. So it's no surprise that Mary is astonished by the angel Gabriel's greeting. Just imagine how she felt when out of the blue an angel addressed her. And not just talks to her, but says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. I'm sure Mary never felt highly favored up to then. In fact, Mary continues later in Luke to talk about her lowly status and how humbled she is. But with all that, Mary has to be even more confused by Gabe's next words. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Now there's a lot of reasons for Mary to be confused beyond simply being a virgin, which is a pretty good reason in and of itself. Yes. No, something else would have confused Mary about this greeting. Even though Mary was young, she would have known the stories of the Old Testament. So she would have been aware of the story of Sarah. And if you remember from a few weeks ago, Sarah and Abraham, Sarah was well into her old age, and I mean old age, before she had a child. God blessed her. Mary would have known the story of Rachel, who was also barren until her prayers were answered. And she had Joseph. In fact, there are six stories of women in the Old Testament who continue year after year after year to try to have children. And finally, finally in their old age, are given one. Now here's the thing. In all these stories, the women were married. And they wanted a child. And they suffered through years of trying. And in addition, the case could be made that all of these women were from the better part of society. Because some were wealthy, others were married to powerful men or to religious leaders. These were women that some could say deserved children. But Mary didn't have a pedigree like that. So we can see why Mary is perplexed. This isn't the way the story is supposed to go. Jesus should have a rich, powerful matriarch as a mother. Or at the very least, Mary should be married and have spent some years trying to have a child before God intervened. I'm guessing that if I started a movie in the middle and you walked in and it showed two men wearing wide-brimmed hats and pointed boots with pistols strapped to their side, staring at each other, arms kind of akimbo, you would know what kind of movie I'm watching. Yeah. It's a Western. There's a pattern to a Western. The white-hatted good guy, the black-hatted villain, the gunfight where good prevails over evil. We know what to expect. 
You may recall me talking in the past few weeks about how the Bible will tell stories in tandem, sometimes using one in opposition to the other to highlight a message. Luke is telling us something important in his story. God has performed miracles before, but in the past there was a template for it, a pattern. This doesn't fit the pattern. And in case we miss it, Luke includes the pattern in Mary's story. We learn that Mary's relative, Elizabeth, is expecting. Now, Elizabeth fits the profile. She's the daughter of the high priest of Aaron. She's married to a priest of the Abijan sect. And she has spent years, years praying to God for a child. This is the way the story is supposed to work, not with some unmarried, poor, young virgin. So what does Luke want us to take away from Mary's story? What are we supposed to notice when we put these two stories side by side? What do you notice? And I'm serious. I want to hear when you think of these two stories, what is Luke trying to tell us? God is in control. God is in control. That's good. What else? Hmm? He's out, of the ordinary. out of the ordinary. I love it. What else? You're, you're hearing this for the first time. You know the pattern. You know how it's supposed to work. And we have Mary over here. What are we supposed to take away? Cryer's faith. Cryer's faith. Oh, my, I, love, I love these answers. I'm going to highlight a couple of them that I want you to make sure you notice. First off, Luke wants us to know God is doing something new. All the old patterns, yeah, out the window. Jesus is the new plan, the new way of doing things. Part of our celebration this time of year is to recognize that God is always doing new things. And because of that, what we think about God today may shift tomorrow as God works through us in new and exciting ways. Can it be scary when our image of God changes? You betcha it is. But we just, we like things to be familiar and comfortable. That's one reason we like to talk about the good old days, because we know them, they're familiar. But let's be honest, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're good. Yeah. In fact, they might be downright bad. Did you know the word nostalgia comes from two Greek words joined together? The first word is nostros, means going back. That doesn't surprise us. But the second word is algos, and it means pain. Nostalgia actually means looking back to a time, even though it may have been harmful. Most of us would rather look backwards, even if that's painful, than walk into the scary and uncertain future. But God is always always doing something new. The other thing to notice is God didn't pick someone like Elizabeth to be Jesus' mother. After all, why not pick Elizabeth? Jesus would have been from, you know, within a family of priests, held in high esteem, living near Jerusalem. Common sense would have been that's the way to go. But that's not who God favored. Nope, it's small town, young, poor Mary. Luke wants us to see God has a role for all of us in God's kingdom. And it has nothing to do with how society sees us. Now Mary could have denied 
God's request. She had enough excuses at her fingertips not to say the least the shame that would have been involved because she had no idea what Joseph was going to do when he found out about this. Mary could have listened to the voices in her head that said, Mary, you're not important enough. You're too young, you're too poor, you're too this, you're too that. And we all know those voices. The ones that tell us we're not enough or too much. The voices that whisper in our ears and say, yeah, but that's not really for you. Those are some of the takeaways for us at the beginning of the Christmas season. Not only is God always doing something different, God is always asking us to be part of it. And there are always angels bringing us proclamations, greetings from God, letting us know we're favored. And in that, there is always an invitation to try something new, to do something uncomfortable, to say yes to God's new plan for each and every one of us. So here's what I would like for you to do during the Advent season, part of our preparation for Christmas. Listen. Listen for the angels this holiday season. Where is God calling you? How is God letting you know you're favored and then asking you to join the mission of making God's kingdom on this earth? And when you hear that invitation, ignore the other voices that give you all the reasons to turn God down. After all, if a scared little girl from a backwoods town is important enough to be the mother of the Messiah, you are important enough for whatever God calls you to do. If you have any questions or want to talk in more detail about this or any other subject, just let me know. I'd love to get together. I want to share with you, in case you're not aware, people have been taking me up on that. And I really enjoy that, that conversation. In fact, I want to let you know that in January, we are doing a series called Ask the Pastor. We will set aside several weeks for me to answer your questions, and you will have an opportunity to write them down on paper or online. So all those things that you want to know about, they can be big theological questions, or they could be like, why do some pastors wear collars and not others? Whatever you want to know, I will attempt to answer. Let us pray. God who invites, we say thank you for calling us to be workers in your kingdom. Help us to hear your angels and to know that we are worthy of saying yes. Remove our fear of the unknown and give us the spirit to embrace the new. This we pray in the name of the one whose birthday we are preparing ourselves for, Jesus the Messiah. Amen.